Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody to our third, I think, uh, power talk this summer. And uh, I'm Jeff Moore, director of the Beckman Institute. Uh, some new faces I think are, I see here, uh, and some familiar faces. So um, I'm here to welcome uh, Jeffrey Herman, who's a teaching assistant professor in computer science. Um, many of us, I would say, not all of us uh, here in the room, but many of us are um, STEM educators, and uh, I've been impressed with some of the really um, far-reaching advances that are going on in the NSF WIDER program, um, which is a team-oriented effort to, to really look at um, how to be more effective in STEM classes, and that's one of the things that uh, we're going to hear about um, from Jeffrey today. Thanks, Jeffrey. Sure, my pleasure. <clears throat> Hi, as I said, I'm Jeffrey Herman. I apologize if you came here, Matt West. Uh, he unfortunately found out at the beginning of the week that he wouldn't be able to be here, so I am filling in. Um, so hopefully, um, and <laughs> you guys are a great group already. We've talked to many of you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, as Jeff Moore said, I've been part of like my career here has been with. I've been here at Illinois with the goal of helping try to create educational innovation across the College of Engineering, and then it's been slowly spreading out across the college, beyond the college into other LAS departments and STEM departments. And so, uh, just a quick background of the context of the frequent testing that we're going to talk about is we, in the College of Engineering, created a program called the Strategic Instructional Innovations Program back in like 2012, that, whose goal was basically to try, like, how do we make our large enrollment lecture courses more engaging, help students learn better, more motivating, more inviting. How do we make just like, because this problem of teaching at scale is just something that no one's ever really addressed or solved. How do we teach hundreds to thousands of students at a time in a classroom effectively? Educational research hasn't even really begun to touch that. And so this is a part of our effort to try to figure out how do we do that, how do we do that effectively? Um, and then we got an NSF grant called WIDER that tries to spend, brought it out beyond the College of Engineering, but the core big, big idea between both SIP and WIDER is we want to mobilize faculty to look at problems, issues in their courses that they have identified that are problems of teaching at scale, and then be, be able to mobilize and empower them to be able to address the problems that they, they've identified. And <clears throat> because we have some of the best minds, some of the smartest people here, innovators, who can come up with really cool and interesting solutions. So the project that I'm going to talk about today is actually something I've, I've, I'm just as big as cheerleader, really, in many ways. I'm like the driving the bandwagon primarily. Matt West, Craig Zillis, who's over there, who's going to be helping answer a lot of questions and helping us facilitate a lot of dialogue, have been really the main drivers of this. But the prop, the, just to give you that context of the setting, is one of the problems that Craig and Matt identified was midterm exams are the worst. And they get worse and worse and exponentially worse as your class size grows. Like, it's the, the, the overhead nightmare of you have to schedule the room, oh, and then, but you have 400, 500 students and about 60 of them can't make the conflict. And so you schedule a conflict exam, but oh, for that conflict, oh, another 10% still can't make that conflict, so you have to do a conflict with the conflict. And then you have this mountain of grading, and then you have, like, uh, and it's just this, it just sucks out a week or two of your life of just trying to get this exam to go. And with, as scale gets bigger, it's just so much worse. And so, given that context, like, what they did was set out to create some tools and resources and um, innovations to enable us to make exams not the worst. And surprisingly, they, I think they overshot that bar quite a bit. And now, not only are people basically not just hating exams, but even more exams, doing it more frequently, and, and because of that, we're seeing students learn more. And so one of the things that we've learned from educational psychology <laughs> is that exams are good in the sense that they really do actually help cement students' learning. If you've ever, I mean, I imagine many of you have had the experience in undergrad where it's like, you went to an exam and you're like, you finally, half of the exam is like, oh, that's how that works. You know, that, that experience, that there's something about being forced to have to recall your knowledge, generate your knowledge, think creatively, work through a problem, through all of its nuances and facets, that helps you actually cement your learning. This is part of how we know that learning works. And so, lots of exam exams are a good thing, even if they are the worst logistically, especially at scale. And so, the goal of this conversation is to, like, to let you guys kind of ask the questions, follow through, kind of, 
how did we go from exams that are to take weeks to of our time and hours and hours of TA grading time to having an exam system where it's like faculty are excited to give more exams. They've been doing this spontaneously on their own. It's like, oh, well, wait, now that I have the, all these tools now, I'm going to go get more exams. I'm going to give my, stu my, my students retake exams because we really want students to learn the material. So why not let them retake it? Because that's, that's going to be good for the learning. They're going to get some feedback. They're going to try it again. They're hopefully learning even more. And again, like I said, well, Jason over there has did a lot of the analysis on this, can confirm. We have seen a lot of evidence that this promotes students learning. Students, some of the classes that have, have tried this with more frequent testing have been seeing the number of A's double on their final exams, that the number of students getting perfect scores is doubling, the number of students failing a final exams is, is shrinking in half on the same final exams that they get used to give in the past. So these aren't things that students are have out in the wild. Um, and so these are some of the really cool outcomes that we've been seeing. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of leave it there, just kind of that's the scene setting. This is why we're excited about this. Um, I think this is part of the power of you know, organizing faculty to solve and engage a problem that is new to the world in terms of having to teach at scale on, on our campuses. So yeah, so that's that's kind of the context. If you guys have questions or com like conversation, I'd love to hear kind of where you'd like to take this conversation as we, we go forward. Yeah, so final exams tend to be kept under lock and key because we don't want the students to actually be able to come back. And so this, we've done this in multiple classes actually, kind of surprisingly. Um, so one of the courses that we did this with was uh, TAM 212 or 251? 251. 251. Um, yeah, so one of the larger, larger they enrollment. Have, you know, they haven't seen the questions and they don't know what they are. No, yeah, exactly. So the idea, like, well, yeah, so, and we have a whole lot of other stuff about reuse and all this other stuff that Craig can talk a lot more about as well if you're interested. But so two other, two of the sides that we've done so far with this um, is one was in TAM 251, which is a large mechanics for, uh, junior, sophomore, junior level course. Um, and so basically we gave this, the, basically most things in the course were the same. Um, they had the standards, two midterms and a final in fall 20, in one fall. Yes. And, then, um, and then the same teacher came back and taught the same course the, the following fall. So it's actually a year. So most students who wait, it's, if anyone's retaken, they probably retook it in the spring. So retakes are probably out of the picture as well. And it was a final exam that was kept private so students go to the exam, they do it and they never receive it back. So the, the questions aren't given out in the, the, the wild. So if there is students who somehow remembered every con all the content on there and tried to distribute it, there's probably going to be a very small impact there. Um, and so one reason why we thought that, and this is one of the, always one of the big challenges with educational research is how do you <laughs> show change over time. Um, but so that was, that was the, the experiment. So, so they went from two midterms and final to was it seven midterms each? And also each of those seven midterms has a, re, a, a second chance exam after it. So very, from very infrequent testing to very frequent testing, um, basically covering the same content knowledge as just each exam was partitioned up into smaller chunks. Um, and so roughly the same amount of uh, contact out, the same number of contact hours, same homeworks, same labs, same discussion section worksheets, same, everything else remains the same pretty much except for how frequently we tested them, we see the fairly large effect size um, and large differences. Yeah. So uh, I've tried. Actually, I work with Mariana da Silva, right? Who mm -hmm. did uh, maybe the time two twelve or something yeah. like this, and I tried to use Perry Lloyd in my class, mm -hmm. it was a junior level class, on topics that are somewhat related to what was ten to twelve class. And so the challenge is the change in the mentality that you have to have. That, that you have to convey to the student because students are used to the concept of partial credit, right? So you go to a derivation, and if you get it more or less right, you get more or less the points, right? I mean, that's, that's the way it works. But the computer system does not allow that to happen. And that, the, student, the students found it astoundingly frustrating, right? Very, very, very frustrating. So indeed, we try to subdivide the questions, just like you mentioned, right? And then they have to answer a number or 
a, a simple expression or something like this, right? And if you don't get it right, the computer says, ah, oh, sorry, it's wrong. And then you have to keep tracking it until you get that one right, and then you move on to the next one. Uh, so, I think so. Have you found that there are some courses where it works better than others? Maybe uh, that, that this concept works very well? As I said, in my class, I did it one semester and we did a whole bunch of problems. And then the next semester I was teaching class, I went back to the old way of doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, what's the experience of the faculty members who, who, who adopted this? So, I, I can perhaps respond since we've done some student surveys on this. Um, <laughs> So just, just so that everybody knows, the, the, the thing that we're doing is computer-based testing. So we have this thing called the Computer-Based Testing Facility. And um, this past spring, we did a survey. We got um, over 900 students responded. Um, and one of the questions that all the students got was, um, you know, how much would you prefer to take a, an exam in the CBTF relative to taking that same exam on pencil and paper? And interestingly, it was a five-point Likert scale, and we got this sort of W-shaped pattern. So there were some students that were very positive, some students that were like, it doesn't matter, it's an exam, it's going to suck either way. You know, <laughs> some people that would much rather have it in on pencil and paper. And so that was kind of interesting, but what was more interesting is that if you, you separate the students based on the ones that are doing computational-related majors, so CS and ECE, they were much more positive than the, the, the non-computational engineering majors. And so um, we do recognize that partial credit is basically the biggest concern. Because we basically you know, also gave them a box to sort of spew their, their hatred and love. And so we, we did get a lot of love, too. This is, you know, um, that a lot of students like the flexibility of when they take the exams. But that, I think the biggest concern that the students had was this partial credit thing. And it's interesting because from the faculty perspective, a number of the faculty that I've talked to, they're not satisfied. You know, they don't like giving partial credit for just you know regurgitating equations necessarily. Like the students are conditioned to, you know, through high school and through you know whatever <coughs> math classes and maybe where it's like okay, even if I don't get the right answer, if I write some relevant things down, I should get some something for it. Um, but do we want to graduate students that never actually get, you know, a problem completely correct? You know, is that something that we want to do? And so, so there's this tension between what we think is, you know, actually valid assessment and, you know, the expectations that the students have. And so, um, so we're, you know, so we're definitely very concerned about this, and we may do some experiments in the fall to look at ways that we can um, allow students to submit their their handwritten work that they do in the CBTF for review after the fact to you know to basically allow some small amount of hand grading for, for problems that they didn't get fully correct um, as a way to sort of you know recognize that there is some value to writing meaningful things down, but you know, you know, maybe not in the same full blown form that pencil and paper is yeah. What's the largest number of students that you have um, used this for? And, and the reason I'm asking that is because I'm curious as to where you do the testing. Is it um, in a facility or is it so I think the last semester we, we did measure about fifty thousand exams. Is that? Yeah. So the fall it was fit, we ran fifty two thousand exams. The largest class this past spring was CS two twenty five that had seven hundred and fifty students. Our lab. So we do this in our lab. In so it's in the basement of Granger Library. There's a physical room that has about ninety computers. If you do the math, 700 people, 90 computers, that means we're stacking them eight high. Um, <laughs> no, we actually do it asynchronously. The students are taking their exams at different times. So typically, we run a three or four day window in which the students make a reservation to be like, okay, I'm going to take my exam Monday at noon. We run 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. Different exams have different overlapping exam slots. Um, so students have flexibility when they take their exams. and um, 
because I can take it on Monday and Jeffrey can take it on Tuesday and I can tell Jeffrey what was on my exam, a common practice in the CBTF is actually to use some form of randomization, either changing the numbers on the problems or, in fact, uh, you know, doing diff giving different students different problems. And then how do you, if you give students different problems, how do you, especially as opposed to just changing the numbers, then how do you normalize all of that? So we try to find problems that are equivalent difficulty. <laughs> and do you do something quantitative? I mean, is that quantitatively assessed, or is it just sort of somebody is evaluating subjectively that I think these are... So you, after the fact, you can go and look at the statistics and see if there's an enormous outlier. Um, <laughs> I don't know, how many people are students in this room? Has anybody in this room taken an exam in the CBTF? I think we've got mostly grad students here. So, uh, <laughs> this, this, this concern you have about fairness, this concern you have about fairness is, is really interesting because it is second to exam security. It is like the first thing on faculty's minds. And it seems to be far from the first thing on students' minds. That, that I had, you know, even though I've taught a class of three to four hundred students many years running this, I've had this conversation with faculty much more often than I've ever had it with students. Um, the students seem to be less concerned about the perceived fairness that, that as much as anything, um, students are very concerned about other students not cheating. And so, they appreciate the randomness. The thing is, if I'm going to do the work to, to study for my exam, I want that you know, score to mean something. I don't want somebody to get an advantage by, by cheating. Um, so uh, it is definitely on my mind. Um, but I think the other thing that one needs to be keep in mind is that giving exams is a uh, is a, is a technique, is something that has uncertainty involved in it. That when I give an exam, I'm sampling your knowledge. That I, I teach for 15 weeks, and then I test you for one hour, you know, you know, maybe not, I guess, some numbers of hours. That I'm not testing you on all of the things that you've done in my class. And so where you chose to allocate your time studying is going to affect your grade based on which subsets I choose to test you on. So there's already some uncertainty, and, and actually the physics people have done some estimations of the uncertainty that exams entail, and I'm pointing at you, but I don't remember if you were on that paper or not. It was not. Okay. This is about paper versus... Uh, so the, the, the Scantron versus um, short answer questions yeah, workout versus... Workout problems like he was mentioning. Oral yeah, we, exams. We found the variation to be small, so it didn't matter, like, <clears throat> didn't matter whether you took a multiple choice versus... A right. workout, five problem workout, partial credit. It was on, on the order of like 3%, I think. If it was. So, so there is some existing, you know, uncertainty by the testing mode. You know, also what subjects you choose to, to you know, actually hit on the exam. And so our goal is just to keep that, you know, unfairness in that same bound. Um, and so... And so I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that in terms of one of the reasons, uh, some of the other reasons why I think having a, a computer-based testing facility that can use some of the same homework platforms that students are using during their practice. And so the C, most classes that are using the CBTF have students do homework in a system called Prairie Learn, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fairly standard-ish, you know, if you've played with Long Cap or you've played with Compass or anything, you have some of the general sense of what that can do in terms of it. it has problems, it sends them to the students, students send them, they get it created, except that it has a little bit more control of authorship, so faculty can write new types of questions. Um, so, like, so Mariana was teaching a mechanics course, and so she started creating a, a canvas so that students could draw free body diagrams inside Prairie Learn and then grade those free body diagrams and give students feedback on them. And so, and so Prairie Learn is more extensible than those other platforms, has a lot more open source, has a lot more. I, I mean, it has a lot more benefits from an engineering perspective, um, but it's, it's kind of this, this online homework platform. And so the same, same platform you're doing your homework on is the same platform you're doing your exam in. And so some of the things that many of the courses are doing is you give students, here's a bunch of practice problems. Here's, here's the homework. And we're going to basically we can sample 
your exam from your homework, in part. And so you get, if, you, if you've really done the homework, if you've really studied, you really understand most of the homework, you're probably going to get a 60, 70, 80% just on it, like, because many of the questions are going to be drawn from that same pool, just with a new random number generated on top of it. And so if you really understand how to add two factors, it shouldn't matter whether they're, it's, they look like this, or like this, or like this, like if you just however you want to do your tip to tail addition, great, then you move on. If you really understand how that math works, it shouldn't matter what variation this gets. And you've had plenty of opportunities to practice it, and then you're being tested on the exact same platform, exact same method, exact same appearance. And so the, the fidelity to the homework is a lot higher, which I think for students matters a lot. Um, because I, I've, the number of times I've heard complaints of like, that exam was nothing like the homework. <laughs> like, and, and often that's going to be the case. And because, well, you get with, with typical, what is it? Uh, we did some analysis on this for a different project um, that I've been working on. Like, you get maybe 80 homework problems over the course of a semester with, when they're all paper-based. And then you get a random five problems on the exam that maybe, um, and those two, like that's a very small sample set for students to begin to practice on and begin to see what are the underlying ideas of these problems. Whereas if you have an online generator that can generate new problems with new numbers, with new orientations of your vectors or whatever it might be, the students can look at hundreds and thousands, potentially if they wanted to, variations of the problem, begin to understand, oh, it didn't just have to be at this 90 degree angle for me to be able to do that trick. It could also be at a 45 degree angle, it could also be at a 30 degree angle. Oh, okay, so it's the, this is the broader principle they can, they can get more practice and help hopefully learn these a little bit better because they can get this multiple passes at the same thing and then get tested on things that are very similar to the, that homework problem that they had seen. So that for, I think, that's my personal hypothesis about some of the reasons why students find it to be fair, even if it is, I got a slightly different exam than you because we got the same, ideally we should both should have been able to practice that same problem to perfection before we went in there and really understood how it works. There's a hand over here, yeah. So I can speak to being a TA in 212. So I did it in 2013. So I did it both as a general TA, and I taught the class in the summer, and then helped it develop in the fall. And so part of your point about doing it once a month and then giving up is patience. So that was 2000. They started in 2012, and they're still developing in 2018. And part of it is you have to be bought in, right? Like, so if the teacher's not bought in, the students are going to be bought in. And, so, and also, part of it is you have a long question, multi part scenario, you have partial credit, and you fail at the beginning. You don't know if they just don't understand the whole problem or they just don't understand the first part of the problem. So we can break it up and they can learn where they don't understand. So it gives them a chance to figure out more nuance where it is. Um, and they also like the practice back to the point you were just making, but so students really appreciate even when we weren't using Prairie Learn and the other different thing for that, is that they only get so many chances and the disconnect between when they get a problem or the complete problem and hand it in, they get feedback is so far, they lost the actual learning opportunity window where you're actually gonna get feedback. So they get feedback right now. So that's sort of the difference between like and co compare to like, well is it like partial credit is because we used to why are we comparing something that may not be as good? Right. So your comparisons aren't necessarily fair if you're comparing to an inferior product. These are like things we've been wrestling with for six plus years, right? So yeah. more, right? So this is part of the problem. I think that the nuance here is <laughs> students actually appreciate this a lot more than you think they would invite it to as someone who is talking to lots of students. Yeah. And there's, and there's different ways to do partial credit as well if that's something you want to be doing. And so whether it's, you can have multiple tries on the exam. So you can submit it, get it wrong, and then submit it again for a reduced credit. If you realize you know, it's like, oh, well, I can't remember if it should be a positive or a negative here. So first time, put it in a positive. Oh, crap, it's wrong. OK, let's flip it to the negative. Oh, I got it right. Yay, so I got 75 out of 100 points for that. Great. Um, so that's some options that we've, we've employed in this, as well as if you want to. So in some programming classes, what people write their own grading scripts. So we have students upload some code, we run that code, we see how a student performs on a number of test cases, and then they get partial credit for how many test cases they pass. If your code doesn't compile, well, you probably shouldn't get credit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so, so some of these types of dis, uh, systems have been in place to be able to provide some
form of partial credit where we can. So you mentioned that one of the components of this computer-based testing is the ability to retake a test. Yes. Right? Is that something that is required, or is that something that's just encouraged? And then, I guess the follow-up to that is, uh, do you have any data demonstrating how that impacts, how or if or how that impacts a student's time spent preparing and studying for the course? That is a great question, a series of questions. Um, so, most courses have adopted one of two general models of second chance testing, um, at least. So there's there's yeah. definitely courses that do not do second chance testing. So second chance testing is the term that we use to be like, oh, I took the exam, I didn't do very well, I get immediate feedback on what my score is, I have some amount of time before I can go back and I can take another version of the exam, uh, you know, and get some sort of, of grade replacement that I, you know, uh, so. Yeah, and so, um, so a number of different courses have tried different approaches to this. So, like, of course, that Craig and I teach uses a full grade replacement policy. Basically, you take the first time, if you don't like your grade, you can come back and try again. And it's over similar material, but not necessarily the exact same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be, so if it's a design problem, it'll be a similar design problem. Or if it's like a, yeah, that's pretty much all we do. Um, or if it's a code writing problem, it's a similar prompt for, hey, here's a similar comparable type of algorithm that we want you to implement. Um, and then you come back the second time, and if your grade is worse, you get the worse grade. If your grade is better, you get the better grade. Um, and so it's up to the student to decide you know, what's worth it. Um, other courses take another policy, which is, okay, you take the first chance exam, if you don't like your grade, then we'll, you can come back and try again, and then we can, we'll average out your grades in some, some weighting scheme. Um, so that your first chance still matters, so you still, it's still best if you do well on your first try, but you, you can try to improve your grade on if you really think you could, didn't demonstrate your mastery very well. So this has been, um, uh, yeah, so this has been happening in two, uh, these two modes are, lead to very different restudy habits. So if students get like an 80 or 70% on the full grade replacement, not surprisingly, they don't come back ever or take the second chance exam. Um, most students, if they got a C or higher, aren't coming back. Um, whereas, this, this blew my mind when we looked at the data. Students in the partial graded placement policy courses, even students who get 100 come back and take the second chance exam. Voluntarily. This doesn't make sense. I don't understand it at all, but it's there. Um, so students, like, and not like, like one or two, like, like the scattered plots of like students' first chance versus second chance grades, if it's like zero to 100, zero to 100, it's like, it's like uniform. Be distributed. It's it's scary. It's like I don't I don't it doesn't make any sense to me why these students who got 100 percent on their second chance, first chance, 90s, 80s, are all coming back and taking it again. It's just really really weird. Um, anyway, so they are doing that. Um, uh, yeah, that sounds pretty hard to study, and I think those are probably so, the students that are going to do well throughout the whole course and the final too. So. Yeah. yeah. So some students are coming back and doing 100 twice. Why I don't know. <laughs> um, so there is degrees of studies. Um, it's very hard because there is a self-selection of who takes a second chance exam. We've been struggling. So I was working with the staff department trying to analyze this and they're like, uh, we don't know how to do this. But some preliminary data suggests that the students who fail the first time and come back the second time are doing slightly better later in the course. But it's, it's super dirty data, and so it's hard to say for sure. What, you know, is it because they came in? And how, yeah, so it's, we're, we're still working on how to analyze that. Yeah. Just, just to follow up a little on more on that. So I, I've actually been doing second chance testing since the day of pencil and paper exams. And so when I did it then, we could potentially double our grading load. And, and we observed definitely students who would not study for the first chance, use it, use it like as a practice test, and, in the, you know, if I do great, well then I've saved myself from studying, and if I, if I don't do well, then I can actually study, and, uh, and so, so we recognized pretty quickly that this was really bad for our grading load, and so, so the policy that Jeffrey mentioned, the one that we use is, uh, on the second chance you can only get up to 90% out of 100, so if you want to get between, you know, more than 90%, you need to do it on the first chance, and then also, uh, we take your second exam score, uh, you know, and replace it even if your grade is lower. So it's, it's not just like I'm, I'm rolling the dice twice 
and you know, just hope magically that I, I'm going to do better the second time. So no, no, we want to develop the student's metacognition in recognizing, okay, you know, I did, did poorly the first time. These are the things I didn't understand. I'm going to go fix those. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take the second chance exam. And, and we allow them just to not submit it. And so if they're like, oh, I actually think I, I may have done worse, I'm just not going to submit it. So we want students to, to not only know the things, but also to know that they know the things. There's no third or fourth chance test. Not yet. Um, <laughs> you say that, but so Tim Brettel has actually done sort of mastery testing where he just cumulatively throughout the semester uh, just said, okay, every week you can retake all of the previous exams if you want. It was a relatively small class, so we let him try this. Um, I don't think he's going to do that again because when you give the students a lot of options to retake, especially late in the semester, what they do is they put off doing the work. You know, it, it's the same sort of self-paced, it, it, and I think it's also indicative of why MOOCs have a very low success rate, is that there's no deadlines forcing me to do things. So, you know, in all my other classes, there are deadlines, and so those deadlines, you know, take precedence. And so I think, you know, having second chance is perhaps a sweet spot. Because one of the other things that is really hard for students is, and I know the physics guys have done looking at this, is, um, students evaluating how prepared they are for an exam. It's very easy to go look at your notes and be like, oh yeah, I know all this stuff, and go to the exam and then get, you know, crushed by the exam. Um, and so, so one-shot testing has that problem where sec se two, you know, second chance testing, you know, if, if, I, if I get crushed by the first exam, then I, then I have a clear, you know, estimate of how prepared I am and I can try to fix that. Uh, and in particular, apparently, um, uh, I forget what the term is, but uh, students that are like the first in their family to go to college um, have particularly low abilities to estimate their own um, understanding. And so the, the hope is that second chance testing uh, will try to be more fair to first time students. So I think it is on our docket, though, to study how much time students study between the exams. I don't, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, so we're going well, we to do an experiment this students. fall. That, that we're, so one of the neat things is because we're using the same homework platform, at least in the class that Jeffrey and I, we're using ProYourLearn both for the homework and the exams. And the, the system logs all the activity that we can actually uh, observe their study behavior you know, when we run an exam as, as a single chance exam versus their study behavior when we run an exam as a second chance exam. So we can compare, do they do the same amount of studying but they just split it between the two opportunities or does it lead to actually more studying on an average? We'll we're going to try a small experiment this, this fall, fall where we introduce a new second chance exam that we didn't previously offer and see, do we see difference in, different patterns between this false students and previous semester students and how they study for the exam. So we'll see. Um, then uh, after that, so then yeah, over here and then there. I mean, I guess talking about like engagement on the higher courses, it's a little bit qualitative, but having more critical tests in your quizzes, do you see increased engagement in class if the students are kind of forced to be kept on the pace of and so then they actually like have better knowledge of the material that's being presented just because they're up to speed? Yes. So there's actually a great quote when we, so um, Matt West, although he's not here, he did survey faculty about their use of the CBTF. And uh, there's a really great quote that we got back from one of the faculty members and see if I can find it quickly. <clears throat> While he's looking, at, I'll just interject real quickly. I think that's, from a kind of a learning perspective, that's one of the things we think is one of the potential benefits for why frequent testing is helpful, is that you, these students are getting regular checks on, do I actually understand what's going on? And the exam is often that benchmark of, oh, I'm keeping up, or, oh my gosh, I'm falling behind. And it's that early wake-up call, the more frequent and early wake-up calls that we can then say, oh, hey, you, you should really pay attention. <laughs> You're not doing it okay. Um, and so, it, ideally, if students are keeping up, then they can build on, I mean, all, not, all learning is built on prior learning, 
And so if we can help them keep up, then that's, that's at least one of the working theories about why we've, we've seen this dramatic improvement in some courses. So, yeah. so this quote says, uh, the CBTF has allowed us to move from a standard three midterm model to a weekly quiz model. As a result, students are staying on top of the material, which has made a substantial impact to their learning, but also feeds back into the lecture and lab component of our course. Students are more participatory in these sections because they have not fallen behind. And so uh, that, I think, is pretty, pretty awesome also. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, if, have there been students where they've done this for multiple classes? Like people were talking about like, the students buying in. It reminds me a lot of like, project-based learning where you do flipped classrooms. You're the only person in your department who does a flipped classroom. All the kids have like, taught themselves how to learn in a lecture-style class, and you flip it on your head, and the students are like, what have you done to me? Why have, you know, I don't like this. So have you, have there been students who've done, you know, I took a class as a freshman that used this, or you know, sophomore and junior, have you been able to keep track of that yet? Um, or is that something that as more people buy in, you'll be able to kind of track those things? The, so definitely it's very common for students to have multiple courses. So there's the, the TAM sequence, theoretical and applied mechanics, that most of the engineering majors have to take is a statics, then dynamics, then mechanics of material sequence that all three courses use it. Um, and then in computer science, there's like eight different courses that use it, many of the, the lower level, 100, 200 level classes. Um, that said, you know, we're still seeing that resistance that I was mentioning. So it's, it, you know, I think we haven't completely figured out exactly the right thing, um, but uh, so definitely we've seen different behaviors um, as, uh, as students get more comfortable in the CBTF. We've observed new cheating vectors that we had to, to plug. <laughs> Um, the other thing that's interesting is it's now, um, so, so we, we have about 25 courses, there are 25 of the larger, I guess 20 of them are 20 of the larger courses in the College of Engineering, um, plus a small handful of other courses that are maybe not as large. We, we now have students that have, um, that they're taking two or three courses in the CBTF in the same semester. And so one of the concerns that some of those students have had is, is testing fatigue and that, you know, okay, it's great if your class is testing every week, but if you have three classes that are testing every week, the students, you know, um, so we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the, the right line? And a lot of the classes that are testing every week are doing this, you know, optional second chance exam, um, but uh, so trying to, to, to restrain ourselves a little and say, okay, do we really need you know, all of these exams? What's the right thing? That in general, I think more frequent, smaller exams is less stressful for the students because it's not like, oh my God, 30% of my grade depends on what I do in the next two hours. Um, but at the same time, I think there is, you know, there's the potential to not give the students a chance to breathe. Well, if I may interject, I'm sure we've also all had the experience where even with the infrequent testing, midterms all seem to happen about the same week. And having three tests in the CBTF for one week, which are each worth 5% of your grade, is one thing. I'm sure we've all had right. students who have three tests all the same week where they're each worth 20 or 30% of your grade. <clears throat> so testing fatigue is... Right. Anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to drop it. No, but I mean that's something to think of. Also, then the students also just getting used to that. Because I think a lot of us, I mean, I'm thinking of taking a test every week and it's starting to, because in my head, yeah, they're worth 40%, 30 or 40% of my grade. So in my mind, tests, I have to dedicate so much of my time. Right. But if they're only worth 5% of my grade, then it's probably also the students just figuring out, I don't have to panic as much about the exams or I don't know. But, um, it's also but, a lot less material. It is a lot less material. That also helps a lot. So that's interesting. So I, I think we've also had a, we've had a, a handful of courses where people have used this, tried using the CBTF to mi mix to negative results. And I think one of the common themes with those was that there wasn't a strong match between what they were doing outside the classroom and what they were doing inside the CBTF. 
Um, and so they, like, they, weren't, they were using Prairie Learn to do their tests, but then they were using some other platform or handwritten homework outside the, outside the CBTF. And so that, didn't tend, that tended to be the common theme between courses that didn't work well. Um, and so I think having your ego, like if, if I were to recommend, a, you know, like get your homework first, get, get, the, get the, how you're gonna get the student to practice with, the, with an eye towards what exams will be writing for this stuff but get, get the support system in place before you start dumping the students into the test, new testing environment. Um, would be a, just one thing I would recommend to help students make that transition if you're like, the student's only gonna see it once and never see it again. Because um, then, at least on a weekly basis, they're still seeing the same homework system over and over and over again. So when they go to the exam environment, something's still familiar uh, for them. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if um, there's any um, examples for upper level Dallas has been doing, Dallas Trinkle, I think, has been using it. Well, I know he's been using Prairie Land for those grad courses. I can't remember if he's been doing CBTF. Um, but we do have, um, so CS421, which is a programming languages and compilers course, is a, I mean, it's, it's a large enrollment upper division course, um, has been doing it. And so one of the things that she did with that course, which is a little bit different, was they had these large coding assignments. And so what she would do is, give them like basically the large MP and then say, when you come to the CBTF, you're going to recode a small portion of it. So you've had a week or two weeks to figure out this problem, really understand it, and I'm gonna take a third of it or a quarter of it or a fifth of it and ask you to recode that. Because if you really understood it, you should be able to recode this no problem. Um, and so no matter which part of it I give you. Um, so that's, I, that, was, that, that was a different model. Um, than I think some of the other courses that yeah. I thought was a very There's interesting a small way handful of like three or, or so 400 level courses. Um, there's a robotics class. There's a numerical methods class. Um, the, I think, you know, it, it depends on, you know, certainly a grad class. So the, the key thing about the computer-based testing facility is it works best when you can objectively auto grade the, the work, and, and I think as we move to the upper level in the grad classes, there's more, we want the students doing, you know, more project-based things, more things where, you know, you, you want the benefit of an expert evaluation in their work. Um, and so I think, you know, it naturally fits, it's, uh, you know, it, it's perhaps more tightly tuned to the kinds of things that are happening at the 100 level, 200 level classes where, um, the uh, you a have the much larger classes and b the more um, I guess lower levels on the Bloom's taxonomy is the bulk of you know although still you know, I think one of the key advantages of of Prairie Learn is you can do you know design tasks that you just need to be able to write a program that evaluates their work so again in computer science we do a lot of programming exams that happen to work better on a computer than they do on pencil and paper because the students can compile their programs and you know test them before submitting them and so they're not losing a point here for missing a semicolon and whatnot and stuff. But you could, I could imagine doing some similar things in a CAD piece of software. It's like students spend time designing a piece of, of machinery in CAD and then they upload their CAD files and that you can, you can potentially auto-grade those as well. So I don't think it has to be strictly right. computer science. Yeah. But but you, you need some objective way of evaluating it to get the most benefit. Yeah, another question is that there's been some studies recently showing that randomness in evaluation actually helps with generalization for students. I, I wonder if like the schedule or the, um, the other things, is there a way to randomize the schedule of testing? Randomizing the, the schedule like, like, of testing yeah, or the random, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, the schedule. So like, sometimes it'll be, like, for some students it'll be not here. We, uh, we certainly, so right now we allow the students to choose their time, so we see interesting things based on what they choose. In fact, what we see on average is the scores go down throughout the exam period, and, and the, the one... <laughs> <clears throat> which is a little counterintuitive because you think, oh, there's more information out there. There's, you know, there's no reason they shouldn't just go up. And but the, the easy explanation is the if you're confident about the exam, you take it when it's convenient. And if you're scared about the exam, you put it off as long as possible. 
and that seems to explain like about 70% of, of that. <coughs> um, so I think randomness, I think that the, one of the things that my understanding of the generalization literature is that oftentimes what you want to be having is the ability to, by seeing multiple examples of the same concept that you begin to see like, oh, what, what were the surface features, what are the not surface features? So I think in many ways, if you're trying to help students generalize their learning, just being able to deliver multiple versions of similar content where the surface features are changing. And so, you know, it's like going back to the vector example, just because that's easy, I have obtuse vectors and I have an acute angle between the vectors and I have right angle between the vectors and that these, oh, hey, that doesn't really matter if I'm adding two vectors. It doesn't matter their general orientation or if they're pointing up or pointing down. Oh, it's just the same algorithm um, is how, how we develop our concepts is by seeing multiple things, the same thing in multiple presentations and being able to be able to realize, oh, these are the same thing. Um, and so that's, I think, one potential major advantage to a, pro a platform like Prairie Learn, where you can randomly and keep giving more and more versions of the same problem that students can develop some of those concepts. So from a randomization perspective and generalizability of learning, I think that's really yeah, yeah. perhaps the more important yeah. uh, the variance. Oh, yeah, that stuff too, yeah. yeah so Maybe it doesn't translate so well. So, so and part of that, I think, is also, it's that part of the mechanic there is forgetting. Um, that if you have time to forget something, it actually it's better for you to come back and relearn it a little bit. Um, and so that's a different effect, which you may not be playing, if, yeah, who knows, because um, it's really hard to tease out if that's something that may also be going on with the more frequent testing, because with with traditional midterm main exam, exams is basically like midterm and finals, like you do, you do it and you completely forget it and never come back and practice it ever again. Do, it, do a different set of things, forget it, never come back it again. Um, I know with our course we've been periodically putting in like, oh, hey, here's some questions from exam one again, because why not? We can. Um, and it's, you should still be able to do this. Um, so well, we put them <clears throat> on the practice exams yeah. also, like, you know, we're, you know, we're saying, okay, 10% of exam four is stuff drawn from exam one, and, and the, we give the students you know, access to a, a, a practice exam generator that does that same thing, so, so it's not a surprise to the students. But again, uh, you know, this notion of doing a thing, not doing it for a while, doing it again, seems to be the, the thing that puts things into people's long-term memory. Um, that, you know, that, that what's very effective for your short-term memory is like the study of you know the night before, do the exam, and then you immediately forget it. You know that, it, um, but if you want students to remember it, you you want them to touch the same material multiple times, separ separated by time. By the way, that's a psychological principle. You can look up research in this that cramming will get you a high grade tomorrow, but if you wait a week. It completely reverses, so the people who distributed the practice over a week, say, get a much more retention high score later than right after you forget it all after a cramming So I think maybe sort of already answered this, but with the weekly testing, each test mostly covers stuff from, say, the previous week, but everything prior is also a fair game. Is that kind of what you're saying? Could be, yeah. So we actually tend to do like a, it's a week of lecture, then you have a week for the homework, and then, you know, the exam would be the following. So they've, they've gotten feedback on their homework before they're forced to, to do it on an exam. Um, in principle, and, they need to know everything in the course for a, when they take the exam? Um, could be. Yeah, so, like, we, so, again, different people, you know, I think what Jeffrey said earlier is important to realize is the CBTF is a tool like PowerPoint. You've probably all gone to classes where they use PowerPoint really effectively in classes where they don't. And so, we're you know, we're still them. trying to, <laughs> we're still learning some of what are the right ways of doing things. Um, the class we teach, basically every two weeks, they have a new design problem that we've either taught them a new piece of a programming language they need to show us or, you know, build a thing that looks like this or whatever. So one big problem, and then some of the exams have a collection of short answer questions with them, and some don't. Um, and so for, for us, it's like exam one, exam four, and exam seven have the short answer questions. And so we don't, we don't force them every two weeks to, to review, but you know, periodically there is this look back. And, and then if you have the weekly testing, it, 
is there a bigger uh, exam at the end, or is it just all distributed throughout the semester? Um, so again, that depends. So in our class, our final is relatively small compared, to, you know, that you could, I guess I see students spending up to two hours doing it, but it's intended to be like a one hour exam, but then a bunch of the TAM classes, they'll have a three hour final, you know, the same big final. So I think it depends, you know, again, that's a design decision. Right. And I think it also depends a little bit on the content. So this is something we were exploring a little bit again was, but now with, since we have more, more frequent exams, and is how, how clearly embedded is prior content in newer content. So like in the mechanics course, you start off teaching the vectors, but then they have to use those vectors to measure like what forces are being applied to this beam. They have to add those vectors together to be able to know, is this beam moving or not? And then, so, but to do that, they need, so then they learned how to draw a free body diagram. And then if you go into, keep going down like statics, then they're doing things like uh, shear bending, shear forces and bending moments. And so you can't do that task without being able to draw a free body diagram, which you can't do without being able to do a vector. And so, like, like the, the ability to do a shear force and bending moment diagram requires you to do the prior three tasks inside of it. Whereas some of the topics that we have, so it's like the, your ability to write Assembly code does not depend necessarily on your ability to draw a Boolean logic circuit. They're, they they have some similar concepts, but one task is not clearly embedded within the other, um, and so I think it may depend on exactly how how cumulative your your test is. And so, <clears throat> did some basic what's called structural equation modeling to see how much do, does one thing predict the other things, and if you can account for that level of prediction, then blah blah blah. Um, there seems to be some difference between courses of how predictive one exam is of the, their performance on the next exam. So like, our, the, the course that we teach, it's like your performance on exam one predicts exam two, exam two, two predicts exam three, exam four, but exam one has no, almost no bearing on exam five, like six and seven. Um, whereas with the TAM, these TAM courses we see, pretty much every exam predicts everything else. <laughs> um, that there seems to be this much more cumulative effect of Oh well, if you if you fall behind, you're totally in trouble. <laughs> but that's some like that's again preliminary. We're still working through that um, analysis. You mentioned short answer, and um, I'm curious what algorithms are available to uh, grade and, and interpret short answer questions and. How that might extend to uh, short answers to essays, or you know, and what what capabilities are coming, or do you see coming down the pipeline? Then? So I I think I perhaps misspoke, or I used words that you're meaning different things. So these are not when I mean short answer. Some of them are numeric or symbolic, or they have to draw something. They're not text entry. We're not doing natural language. That's one of the things that we want to do. But we haven't yet because uh, even though I don't know exactly what the state of the art is for machine learning to auto score short answer, but we uh, you, you obviously want that to be super reliable because if it's not, the student's going to come to you and going to complain, and you know uh, part of the goal of this is to have less students complaining. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so I think that's super interesting something we haven't done yet, but a lot of it's just sort of these, um, what I refer to as blocking and tackling exercises of like, okay, you know, it's like, here's a circuit, give me the truth table that this circuit, you know, is. And so it's a, it's a, it's a much smaller task than write a piece of code that does this. Um, I will say the, the SAT and the GRE are using AI to, to, to grade their essays in there. So I think that there exists Technology that could could do that. Uh, yeah. Where you fall on whether that's something. Yeah, that and, want I, and I think a lot of universities are ignoring those scores because <laughs> you can write a formulaic essay that has no content that <laughs> gets scored well. You know, you basically, you know, just like if you've been following machine learning at all, like you know, you can you can make this picture that looks nothing like a banana that an M, you know, that. That the machine learning algorithm will swear is a banana. You know, that just if you if you know what features it's looking for, you can you know just have this blurry image that says, ah, that's a banana. And so um, I don't think our students are necessarily you know going to know 
how to do that for these sort of answer questions. But I th yeah, I think I think the technology has made a lot of uh, steps with it. Well, I don't think it's as bad as you say. I've served on college board committees, okay. and they've done a lot of testing of uh, a computer graded essay versus a, a human, and they agree fairly well. They've even tried this to uh, game it, so they'd write a very erudite sentence and repeat it 20 times to see if that gets graded well as an essay, and it doesn't. Okay. So they, they have this down reasonably well. Okay. So I think one of the other comments that I would add to that, though, I think is the, the, oh, like, the trade off, like, so delivering an exam is super easy. Um, I forget, like, I was at a conference giving a, sim a talk on this exact one of our studies that we did, and I was like, and right now I am giving an exam. While I'm in this talk, I have like, my students are taking an exam, it's being graded, this is great, I'm, I've been gone for the entire week. I did zero thoughts, and so the nice thing about the computer-based testing facility is that like, when you're delivering an exam, it's fairly, it's no stress whatsoever, it's pretty much happens. For the faculty. Automatically. Yeah, for the faculty member, yes. <laughs> for the faculty member. But the, there is a lot of overhead development, and so I think getting the, like, while MLP technology may exist, how do you create, the, like, uh, like, so I think one of the things that we're trying to encourage faculty to do, and one of the things why I think the SIP and why your eff previous efforts were really important to help make this a, as accessible as it has been, is that we had groups of faculty saying, yes, we're going to teach the course the same way, we're going to teach it, like, with consistently from semester to semester, so the time invested in developing these large banks of questions is actually worth it in the long run, and so I think one of the big things that we want to encourage people to do is not just be like, oh, I'm going to go jump head first into this and then have n when no one follows you. <laughs> like that's, you're going to get burnt out pretty quickly if you keep developing all these large things questions just to be used once. Um, so do you have a plan for how it's going to continue to be used beyond the initial development? And so I think that those even more so the more sophisticated the grading models become. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to encourage people to think about as well. They're great questions. One more. Um, <laughs> I guess it was sort of following up on that. Do you have, or is there an option in these tests to have a short answer portion that then essentially gets sent to the professor or the TAs and then they grade, you know, one Off problem one, yeah. out of the... Yeah, yeah, so um, there definitely you can. Um, we're trying to make that even the interface even better because right now the interface is uh, you can then download an Excel spreadsheet that has name and answers, and so we uh, we're trying to get a, a better interface. So if you're familiar with something like GradeScope or something like that, have that kind of interface where it's basically you can just go through every student and see their answers and score them, you know, in there. Um, uh, but definitely. Um, we recognize that, yeah, there, there is value to that, but we don't support it as well as we'd like quite yet. But you definitely could. And, and a lot of, the historically, the way that we did coding questions was exactly that. You know, we'd say, okay, have the student test the code locally on the machine. You can, you know, practice, and then finally you submit it, and then I would wait till the exam period was completely over and, you know, bulk grade the things, you know, on my laptop. We've since shifted over to a system that now when you submit the code, it fires up a container on AWS, runs a bunch of testing scripts, whatever you want, you know, and five seconds later, it's got a grade for you, and it says, aha, you got 70% right now, do you want to try again? You know, we have that ability now. Um, but definitely, you know, we can just jam the answers in the database and then, you know, pull them out later for manual grading if that's what you wanted to do. Okay, before we wrap up, um, just a couple of things. First of all, if you haven't already completed a survey, we uh, value your feedback and input. Um, the second thing is, uh, on your way out, there's more food, so make sure you grab it and take it back to whoever your uh, Hungry friends are. And, friends. Um, <laughs> whatnot. Um, thirdly, uh, actually, would you mind the wider SIP uh, team introducing yourselves one more time? Because there may be people who would like to come and, and talk to you in addition to Jeffrey and, and You've all been part of this, and we just had one person stand up. But it would be helpful to get your names and uh, uh, in case people want to come and talk. Sure. So, hi, I'm Craig Zillis. I'm an associate professor in computer science. I'm Jose Mastri. I'm a professor in physics. Uh, this is a graduate student. Introduce yourself. 
Uh, Jason Morphew, I'm a doctoral student in educational psychology. And the other two people who are here, Mike Glass is a PI on the, on the wire grant, and um, Jonathan Tompkin in geology is uh, the fourth. And one more person who we should mention is Tim Bridal, who's been doing a ton of the development work as well in aerospace engineering. And so, Matt, Matt's in me mechanical uh, science and engineering. I think I've always had the attitude that, um, you know, as an educator and as a researcher, we have uh, this great opportunity to experiment in our classrooms just like we experiment in the laboratory. And I think we saw a really great example of that uh, put into practice today and, and clearly uh, one that uh, I think, you know, we can all look forward maybe to uh, participating and taking it. So thanks a lot for coming and sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you or somebody you know is interested in collaborating, by all means, shoot us an email. We're happy to talk to see what we can do. Especially if you want to help with data analysis. All these great questions. <laughs>